But you can see up here that from this one figure now I've created not only equilateral triangles, but I can create squares. There's actually a way I could create a pentagon, a hexagon. Seven-sided figure is interesting because in geometry there's no way of producing a perfect he uh, heptagon, which is the seven-sided figure. You can create perfect three, perfect four, perfect five, perfect six, perfect eight, but not a perfect seven. And that has to do with some of the peculiar uh, symbolical associations of the number seven. Um, anyways, there were, so there were two systems of Masonic geometry that were both generated out of the vesica. The ad quadratum basically started with a square. There's a, there's a basic uh, numerical relationship that pertains to the square, and it's the relationship between the square and its diagonal. And that's a very special relationship. If the side of the square is 1, the diagonal becomes the square root of 2, which is, a, which is a, one of the mystic numbers that doesn't terminate or doesn't repeat. Um, likewise, in the vesica, if we take the width as 1, the length becomes the square root of 3. So in terms of the vesica, we have 1 to the square root of 3, and in the square, we have 1 to the square root of 2. And these, this is the basis of our, the whole system of dynamic symmetry right here. It would be too much to try to go into the specifics of that now, but when I do a sacred geometry class, what I do is everybody has a compass in hand, a pad of paper, and we draw, we draw, we draw. And by doing the drawings like they did back in the old Platonic academies or the Pythagorean lodges, that's the way you really get this comprehension of the geometry in your own mind, in your own consciousness, through hands-on. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip some stuff here. I'll show this, I guess, here. That is a, uh, the quadrature of the circle. We've seen that representing the cardinal directions. It also represents not only the cardinal directions north, south, east, and west, it also represents the, the one-fourth division of the great year cycle. And by using the same technique I just used over there to create that square, we can create a square out of this simply by using that distance right there and using this point as a center and then using that point as a center. And by projecting these lines, we can perform the same operation around and end up with this figure, which we find uh, one of the four fundamental relationships between a square and a circle. In this case, we have an inscribed, a circle, as we say, is inscribed within the square. We can circumscribe the square, which would be this, and then we can create square and circle of equal perimeter, and then we can create square and circle of equal area. Each one has different applications traditionally and in architecture and art and so forth. And since we don't have time, I've got all of this good, rich stuff here, but we're not going to be able to get into it today. I'm going to cheat a little bit here. For the sake of hurrying up. Two, four, six, eight. Ah, very good, yes. All right, what I've done here is I've created three sides of a square. Can you see that? Okay, now instead of putting in the fourth side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my compass here. I'm going to set my compass to the diagonal of the square. You see that? Okay. If I swing that down this way, then I transfer the same distance here and come up like this. I can then project each side of this square by that amount and I get a rectangle like this. Okay, this rectangle has special properties. The, length, the long side is equal to the diagonal of the square drawn on the short side, right? So we would say that this relationship is 1 to the square root of 2. We call this a root 2 rectangle. A root 2 rectangle has a very interesting property which no other rectangle has. And that is that if we were to enter in its diagonal like this 
and I was to draw a perpendicular to that diagonal that passes through any of the corners. What would happen is that um, I'm cheating, by the way, <laughs> which I am allowed to do, by the way. I want to just get the wrong. If I draw a line at right angles to the diagonal, it hits on the other side in the point that exactly divides that rectangle in two. And when it does that, what it does, in effect, is it creates a duplicate of itself. It's, it's a model of cell mitosis, if you will. And by entering in diagonals like this, we can create a whole slew of internal symmetries, and all of the parts are reflecting the whole. Um, if you can see the outline of this rectangle, if I were to rotate it and enlarge it, it would have exactly the same proportions. And of course, once I, uh, let's see, let's put this diagonal here in like that, and now I can use those crossing points to subdivide each of those and each of these. Now we can look at this. This rectangle here, if I blew it up, would have the proportions of the whole. This is an example, a very simple example of dynamic symmetry. This particular rectangle was used frequently in ancient art and architecture, over and over and over again, very redundantly. Um, one example of it here is this image that I showed you, the front piece to that medieval Bible. And there is the root two rectangle superimposed over it, showing how the root two rectangle creates a framing grid. And the whole com composition is within that root two rectangle. And this is a very simple example, but it, it conveys the idea. And by putting in the diagonals, you can see generally the idea was, was you use the dynamic rectangles as a compositional grid, but you didn't necessarily slavishly put everything on it because that was part of it is the, the difference is just like, you know, using us, you know, if we took and measured our cubits, what you discover is even though there's a mathematical ideal, very few of us are exactly the mathematical ideal. We all deviate a little bit and that's what gives us, makes us all so interesting, you know, and so much variety. Otherwise, we'd all look pretty much like, um, you know, I guess like the, the, those robots on that uh, Will Smith movie a few years ago. We'd all look the same. Um, but what they do here, you can nonetheless see that certain key th elements of the composition are, are actually positioned according to those points within that root two rectangle, the power points, if you will. And those power points are the ones where you create, like um, over here, in this one here, for example, there's a point, there's a point, there's a point, and there's a point. Now, those four points actually create another rectangle of the same proportions within. So there are certain key points within each of these. So this is one of a family. That's a root two rectangle. There's a root three, a root four, a root five, a root six. Beyond the root six, I haven't been able to find any examples of, of actual usage, but I've found examples up to a root six rectangle. Could you go back to that? Yes. I find it very intriguing that his right foot is outside of the three. Yeah, what do you think that means? Maybe he's not confined by that geometry. No. That might be the interpretation. I've pondered that foot outside the rectangle many, a t many times. The left hand, to me, looks like it's hanging right there in the center holding up the... Yeah, holding the, the, the sphere. Yeah, and then of course also the, the, the vertical axis is right there, almost tangent to the point where his hand hits the sphere. Well, this is the kind of things you do in sacred geometry. You know. In nature, uh, nature gives us a, a very interesting example of, of root two geometry. This is Mari, Mari Oriental on the moon, one of the great impact craters on the moon. And once impact craters get about 
oh, say roughly more than 25 or 30 miles, depending on the density of the target material, they start becoming multi-ringed. And what you have to visualize is that in the tremendous energies released in a great impact, the solid matter, in this case the, the lunar material, is essentially liquefied. And waves propagate outwards from the epicenter of the impact. And those waves are following mathematical frequencies. And what happens is, is as the, the liquefied rock is moving outward, it's also cool, rapidly cooling down and then it recrystallizes. And when it recrystallizes, it locks in or freezes in uh, those geometric ratios of the waves. And in this case, what we do here is we'll lay on a series of circles. Each one of these circles, if we start with this inner circle, which is the inner ring, and we multiply it by the square root of 2, we get the next circle. And that multiplied by the square root of 2 gives us the <coughs> diameter of the next circle and so on. In fact, this root 2 relationship amongst the rings is how astronomers have come, that's one of the criteria that they are now using to identify large-scale impact structures throughout the solar system is, is that occurrence of that root 2 relationship. And that's a root 3 rectangle, which I think we'll not talk about today because we don't have enough time. A um, few beautiful examples, though. Root 3 is where we get the Now, once you learn to deal with these figures on, on two dimensions, you realize that concealed within the two-dimensional is the potential for the three-dimensional. Here, if you look at this in a certain way, you should be able to see the octahedron. Can you see the octahedron? If I turn this the certain way, you'll see that, you know, here's one of the equilateral triangles that make up the face of the octahedron. A tradition which has been credited by many learned men over the centuries is that the ancients encoded their knowledge of the world in the dimensions of their sacred monuments. And my own studies have confirmed that to me redundantly that that's the case. Chart Cathedral has been often called the Golden Book of the West because there's so much going on there. It's so rich in symbolism. This is the ground plan of Chart Cathedral. Now. Um, there's the axis from the portal of judgment in the west there down to the apse down here, the apse of the choir, which is the full length of the nave plus the, the choir plus the apse. Here we have the transept, and it's in that relationship right there that we get the vesica. And when we enclose that in a rectangle, that gives us the next rectangle in our family of dynamic rectangles called the root 3 rectangle. Because if we, whatever this length is, we multiply by that by the square root of 3 and we have that length. This is the root 3 rectangle. And there's a relationship between the root 2 and the root 3 rectangle in that if we enter in the diagonal of that root 2 rectangle over there, it's actually the square root of 3. In other words, this diagonal right here, its length is the square root of 3. Interesting triangle here. It has 1, square root of 2, square root of 3. So the square root of 3 can be generated out of the root 2, just as the root 2 was generated out of the square. So each dynamic rectangle contains inherent within it the seeds of the next one in the sequence. So here to get the root 3 rectangle, I take the root 2 diagonal, twice, like this, and there it is. And that root 3 rectangle is the proportions of the vesica, and it's what we see manifested right here. Here's the vesica, and enclosing the vesica is a root 3 rectangle. Through the Pythagorean theorem, you would say that the square of 1 and the square of the square root of 2 would be equal to the square of the square root of 3. That's right. What Bill just said is if we, to get this hypotenuse right here, we square that, we square this, square root of 2 squared is just 2, right? We add them together and we get 3, and then we take the square root of that, and that's the length of the hypotenuse. 
Is that what you were trying to tell us, Bill? The labyrinth, how, how does that fit into that grid pattern? Do I, let's see, I, th I, I think I've got it coming up, okay. Uh, Lincoln Cathedral, England, the choir in the eastern window. Now in this particular elevation, we, we find ad quadratum and ad triangulum integrated, which, which was allowable. And right there, see the equilateral triangle, and right there is the square. And now the square manifests the root two geometries, the root two mathematical relationships, the equilateral triangle represents or manifests the root three geometry. In the equilateral triangle, all three sides are equal. And if we split it down the middle this way, we discover that this to that is one to the square root of three. This is the crossing vault of Ely Cathedral. And there we see octagonal geometry, which is derivative of the square and root two relationships. And in this particular case, um, we see the perfect integration of structure and geometry. Angkor Wat, Cambodia, 12th century, laid out on a grid on the ground plan. Let's see. Uh, there's the ground plan of the temple, and we lay a square on top of it, and then we put in the diagonal of the square, and by swinging that square, that diagonal down, it generates a perfect root two rectangle, which is the outline in green. So it would appear that over there in ancient Cambodia, they were using the same system of geometry as the cathedral builders were. Now what's interesting here is Chartres Cathedral and Angkor Wat were being built at the same time. The quotes that I skipped over quickly there were referring to the internal astronomy, the astronomical alignments that um, in Angkor Wat, the sun itself was so important to the builders of the temple that even the content and position of its extensive bas reliefs are regulated by solar movement. Um, that's what we're going to find out is a key element of all sacred architecture is that it's designed after the movements of the heavens, invariably. You not only find the geometry, but you find the astronomy. I think that there are three key elements in all sacred structures. The geometry, the astronomy, and the, the geodesy and or geomancy. Because they're cited with particular, not only, I mean you can take any place on the surface of the earth and orient it to the sky, but only certain places were chosen and usually they were places that were of considerable sanctity, or in other words, places of power. And these were the places that were chosen to, to, to manifest these principles of geometry. St. Mary's Chapel, Glastonbury, England. And here's the ground plan of St. Mary's Chapel. Anybody want to take a guess as to the rectangle? It's not a root two, is it? It's, it's not fat enough for a root two. No, good guess, but root three. It's a root three rectangle. And the root three rectangle has this particular relationship to a circle, is that the short side here turns out to be one sixth of the circle. It's also equal to the radius of a circle. In, in my uh, slideshow, the vertical dimension is a little bit distorted from my computer screen. I don't know, the projector distorts it a little bit. So sometimes the proportions look a little bit off, but by bringing in the hexagon, you can see the relationship. See, a hexagon has a relationship to a circle in that if you take the radius of the circle, it exactly steps off the circumference six times. So each one of these sides of the hexagon is equal to the radius of the circumscribing circle. And that's how the geometry of this particular chapel. Now this goes back to the, to the, to the grail question here because 
According to the Grail legend, after the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea took the chalice to England. And where I showed you the Glastonbury, the, 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 the lid to the chalice well, that's here at this site, at Glastonbury. And in this, as the story goes, um, this St. Mary's Chapel was built over the ruins of an earlier chapel, which had in turn built over the ruins of an earlier chapel, which had been the original one, built by Joseph of Arimathea back, you know, 19 centuries ago, or, or even longer. And according to the story, the um, original chapel was circular, and the diameter of that served as the width of the rectangular chapel that was built over that spot, and the foundation stones of that rectangular chapel were preserved in this one. This chapel happens to be 39.6 feet in width and 68.6 feet in length. If you divide one into the other, you'll discover that you get the value of the square root of three. But 39.6 is a rather interesting uh, dimension because that's the number of the, that's the, um, there's a, a, a circle, the, one of the inner circles at Stonehenge is precisely the same size, um, which uh, I suspect is not a coincidence. And just to complete it there, you can see how the vesica fits in there, the length and width of the vesica. And the hexagon has many internal symmetries that can be generated when you start playing with it. Um, when we do our translation from 2D to 3D, let's see if it's in there. No, there's our octahedron again which is this figure. But we can generate, actually, we can generate all of the platonic solids in a similar fashion through projection from the 2D view. And then, of course, by connecting alternate vertices, we get the so-called Seal of Solomon. And I'm going to hurry through some of this because we're just about out of time. So there's the equilateral triangle split up the middle. And this is where we get the root 3 relationship. If this is an equilateral triangle, then this is going to be half of that. And this, the relationship here would be, this would be um, 1, 2, square root of 3. And the actual value for the square root of 3 is about 1.732 in round numbers. The Great Rose Window is also a depiction of the, of the zodiacal wheel. It's, it's a circle of 12-fold division. It represents also scenes out of the, the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelations. And um, we find that 12-fold geometry represented in the chakras, particularly which one? The heart chakra, Anahata, the Anahata chakra, which is the one in the middle. We find the geometry of a meditating figure is based upon the equilateral triangle. And if we look at the Anahata chakra, the particular geometry of it is the 12-fold division of the circle. It's represented as a 12-petaled flower. But you'll see, notice in it, within it, we have the Seal of Solomon, the six-pointed star. And there's a closer-up view of it. And the Great Rose Window, also div dividing a circle into 12. And to recapitulate the zodiacal wheel, the circle divided into 12. And let's see if I've got it. Yes, you asked about the labyrinth. This is the labyrinth on the floor of Chart. And there's an interesting relationship between the labyrinth and the rose window in that the uh, portal of judgment is up there. But when you walk in and you're standing at the threshold of the portal of judgment in the, in the west, the distance, not only the distance up to the Olgival vault, the point of the vault is the distance to the water table under your feet, the distance to the center of the great rows is the same as the distance to the center of the labyrinth. So what happens is that 
if you and the other fact is that the rows and the labyrinth are the same circles of the same diameter. So if you could take the facade of Chart and fold it down, the rose window would superimpose on the labyrinth. And then the labyrinth would suggest a path through the cosmic wheel. And I think that could be very, very profoundly um, meaningful.